Sometimes you just have to stop where you are. The prophet Amos. What little we know about him comes from that verse that says, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I am a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees. We know from the first verse that he was from the village of Tekoa. Now the problem with that is that there are two Tekoas, one in Galilee and one in uh, Samaria. The third book of the 12 minor prophets. You know, for the first few centuries after this was compiled, and biblical scholars say that it was around 750 to 700 BC, so a while back. For the first couple centuries after it was compiled, it was seen as, thus says the Lord. And because the Lord said it, it must be so. But then it fell into disfavor. And for call it 2,500 years, thereabouts. Nobody used it. Because this is one of those books, if you want hellfire and damnation, this is where you want to go. Six times, woe to you is uttered. Woe to you, Edom. Woe to you, Samaria. Woe to you, Jerusalem. Whoa. Whoa. So anytime the number six appears in scripture, what? Ah. Some people say pay attention and some people say I don't know. Well, how about this? How many how many days did it take God to create the world? What happened on the seventh day? Rest. Rest. So, six in numerology, if you're into that, six is incomplete. Six is not good because you want to be complete. Okay, so we know not very much about Amos. We know that this book has been used as a tool in the last couple centuries, including ours, as one of those books where if you want to slap somebody upside the head with your Bible, this is what you want to grab. Please don't do that. When I brought the offering up this morning, I noticed this petal from this arrangement that Carol had brought this morning, laying on the table. And it occurs to me, this is an apt metaphor for the book of Amos. Are you with me so far? Amos made it very clear that the words he was offering were not his. I am not the messenger of doom. I am simply the messenger of God. Now, Israel had been raised. And by this point in the story, the kingdom had been divided. Israel was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. And for nearly a hundred years, 
the Assyrians, the next great empires arrived in the east, have been very quiet. But all manner of holy heck was about to break loose. And so a prophet who comes and says, doom, destruction, the Lord is about to visit upon your head everything that you deserve. But, you see, we look at these flowers and think how pretty they are. I mean, just the, the richness of the purple. Extraordinary. But what can you tell me about these beautiful flowers in this box? They will die. They will die. Their glory will fade. Already, the blossoms have started to fall. Why? In the manner of life, that which is not growing is dying. Amos goes to great lengths, or God goes to great lengths through Amos, to point out that Israel, the first of the two parts of the divided kingdom, would fall because they had lost sight of what God had asked them to do in the beginning. They had given way to oppression, injustice, extortion. They had oppressed the poor to such an extent that they thought they were all that. Oh my goodness, look how powerful we are. We don't need those Southerners. Look at us. We are the chosen ones of God. They were in a vase that was about to be smashed in just another generation. You see, Amos comes at a time when Israel was convinced that if we just do what we want, God will be okay. One of the things that emerged in the conversations I had with friends that live in England and, and Scotland this past week was that there were people who still think that they are a mighty worldwide empire and are convinced if they just get their country back Somehow the wealth of the nations will once again flow into the treasury. Does it sound familiar? There are some in this very country who think the same thing. If we just get our country back from those people, whoever they are, everything will be hunky-dory. We'll get back to the good old days. When we when we you see Amos has a word for us because what passes for correctness and rightness is superseded by oppression and disparity. A great nation like ours leads the world in per capita incarceration. We are rising in the table of infant mortality. In a land flowing with milk and honey, there are some who woke up this morning not knowing where their next meal would come from. 
And for us who are comfortable, who are well-fed, who are living in relative safety, we think the world is good. The king, Jeroboam II, who ruled in Samaria at this time, thought he had it all figured out. He thought that if he just ignored the problem, God would be okay with it. Because as long as God didn't strike him dead, life was good. Little did he know that his house would be gone in another generation because he had ignored the very words of God, lift up the brokenhearted, tend to the poor and the orphan and the widow, comfort my people, those who call upon my name. We live in a time where there is uncertainty, where there is concerns about retirement or health or will the Cubs ever win the World Series? I toss that last one in because so often that's what we focus on. We focus on the things that are not of God. We focus on the things that ultimately when we stand before the judgment throne and are asked to give an account of our lives, we will not be asked who we cheered for in the last election. Or who we which t-shirt we wore supporting which product. Or how often we attended worship. We will be asked, I believe, we will be asked, did you do what I told you to do? Did you reach out? Did you visit? Did you care for those who could not do anything in return. Because you see, the power of this little book, with all of its dooms and glooms, it must be a warning to us. It must speak to your heart. Okay, so, so what? So is this just one of those old books that we can kind of skip over because it's not, it's not fun, it's not pleasant, it's not woo-woo? A book like this is important for us. Here in the Bitterroot Valley, because before we start casting aspersions on all the cities and states and nations mentioned in this book, we must first ask, is God saying the same to us? Now, a factor that has to emerge is that nothing the prophet said got through. The, the destruction of the Assyrians would descend upon Samaria and not long after Jerusalem itself would fall. But we don't have to do that. You see, the thing that emerges from Amos more than the doom and gloom, more than the warnings, more than the 
Here's a list of everything you've done wrong that has deserved punishment. The one thing that comes out for me is that God loves justice. God loves people for what they can be, not what they can do. Amos responded to God's call and he lays out the attitude of prophets. I didn't have a choice. The word of God was so strong in my life that I had to say something. And that, my friends, this morning is our challenge. In the marketplace of ideas, there is a lot being said. I have no idea how many words exist in the English language. There are hundreds of thousands. In the absence of the word of the Lord, the world will fill in those gaps that in that silence with another message. It is up to us Christians those who call upon the Lord, those who come week after week and worship the living God and then go about the rest of the week as if there were no God. If the word of the Lord is speaking in your life, you must tell someone. The world must know where you stand. Otherwise, they will assume you stand for nothing or will fall for anything. <laughs> The world has to know this. Because what's being said by the politicians, by the media, by your neighbors, even by ourselves. Can't be what God intends for the world. If God is real in your life, if you truly believe that the Lord God Almighty is in this place this morning, then during this week, I invite you to spend at least five minutes coming by this property and seeing what Twinwell people are doing. But, and there's always a catch. Don't think that the word of the Lord or the activity of God's people is limited to only the professionals, only to the young, only to those who are paid to do it. The problem with Israel's story and Judah's story is that they had stopped listening to God. And so when a prophet like Amos came by and said, the word of the Lord is thus, they had no idea what he was talking about. So it is incumbent upon us this week to be in the presence of those who have heard God's call in their life. And then to step back Come into the sanctuary, go into the prayer room, sit in your car, and ask God, are you speaking to me? Is there a word from the Lord? Speak, for your servant is listening. This is, this is a good day to be in the presence of God. And if it please God, tomorrow will be another chance to do something about it. Amen. Now I invite you to stand if you are able.